I asked you a yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is no. Is Trump is not immune. No, this is not a COVID thing. It's a legal thing. Uh, American presidents are not immune from criminal prosecution if they break the law. Well, for now. The United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, aka the DC Circuit, has issued an opinion answering an important constitutional question, whether a president can order SEAL Team 6 to kill their political rivals without being charged with a crime. Now, the average American probably thought they already had the answer to this question because, like, duh. America declared its independence from Great Britain because the colonists preferred coffee over tea, hated being taxed, and didn't believe in an absolute monarch. Uh, the Declaration of Independence even includes a grievance about King George III ordering British Marines to kill two Annapolis sailors without being punished for it. But then Donald Trump got indicted for crimes he allegedly committed while being president, and this ignited a dispute over whether the president can commit any crime he wants as long as Congress says it's fine after the fact. They say, I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. The DC Circuit Court of Appeals has now slapped down this argument, clearing the way for the criminal case against Donald Trump for election interference to proceed. And yes, before you even ask, it is possible these SCOTUS could overrule this decision, and we'll talk about how likely that is. So let's start with how we got here. As you might have heard, Donald J. Trump was elected the 45th president of the United States on November 8th, 2016. He was sworn into office at noon on January 20th, 2017, and served until his term expired at noon on January 20th, 2021. At that moment, President Trump became former President Trump and his successor, Joseph R. Biden, became president and began his own four-year term. Now, although the sequence is mandated by the Constitution, according to the Court of Appeals, quote, it did not proceed peacefully. The government alleges that from the election day forward, quote, Trump denied that he had lost his bid for a second term and challenged the election results through litigation, pressure on state and federal officers, the organization of an alternate slate of electors, and other means. Now, in perhaps one of the worst legal takes of all time, uh, some legal commentators who should absolutely know better have commented that it appears that this decision seems to say that uh, Trump does not get a presumption of innocence, pointing to a section where the Court of Appeals takes the allegations as true. This is not a conspiracy against Donald Trump. This is the standard that every court of appeals always uses uh, when you're dealing with a motion to dismiss. The court was testing the legal sufficiency, not the factual sufficiency. This is the standard that every court always uses. This is not unusual. But the court continued summarizing the allegations. These efforts culminated in a rally at the Capitol on January 6, 2021, the day set by the Electoral Count Act for the transfer of presidential power between Trump and Biden. The rally headlined by President Trump resulted in a march of thousands to the Capitol and the violent breach of the Capitol building. The breach delayed the congressional proceedings for several hours, and it was not until the early morning of January 7th that the 2020 presidential election results were certified, naming Joseph R. Biden as the soon to be 46th president. And I'm sure, as you well know, after the riot, hundreds of people who breached the Capitol were convicted and imprisoned, and the government charged Trump with crimes related to challenging the election results and interfering with the sequence set forth in the Constitution for the transfer of power from one president to the next. Now, Trump challenged the indictment on the grounds that his acts were protected by presidential immunity. The district court disagreed, concluding that, quote, uh, the Constitution's text structure and history do not support the existence of such an immunity and that it would betray the public interest to grant a former president a, quote, categorical exemption from criminal liability for allegedly attempting to usurp the reins of government. The district court also rejected Trump's claims that his indictment was barred by the impeachment judgment clause. Now, Trump appealed the decision and district court judge Chutkin stayed the criminal proceedings pending the outcome of the appeal. The special counsel filed a petition for certiorari requesting that the Supreme Court decide the issue before the DC Circuit had a chance to weigh in. The Supreme Court denied the petition, meaning the case would have to proceed through the circuit court. Now, after oral arguments, the DC Circuit upheld the lower court's ruling that, quote, for the purpose of this criminal case, former President Trump has become citizen Trump with all the defenses of any other criminal defendant. But any executive immunity that may have protected him while he served as president no longer protects him against this prosecution. And the court summarized, quote, former President Trump claims absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for all official acts undertaken as president, a category he contends that includes all of the conduct alleged in the indictment. So what is executive immunity and where does it come from? Well, you might be surprised to learn that there is no explicit constitutional text granting the president immunity. 
The framers explicitly created immunity for other officials, uh, but they seemingly left out the presidency. The Constitution Speech and Debate Clause provides that, quote, senators and representatives shall in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same and for any speech or debate in either house. Now, law professor Sakirshna Prakash, an expert on presidential power, says the framers wanted to ensure that no one tried to obstruct congressional meetings by arresting members of Congress. They also gave members of Congress immunity from civil lawsuits for what they say on the floor. At the Constitutional Convention, James Madison raised the issue of giving the president uh, similar immunities and privileges, but no one wanted to talk about it, so they didn't debate it at all, which is pretty solid evidence that the framers didn't intend to give presidents broad immunities. However, the judiciary eventually invented the concept of executive immunity. Executive immunity is a doctrine that shields presidents from most civil lawsuits, including conduct that occurred during their presidential terms. In Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court ruled that a president is entitled to absolute immunity from legal liability for civil damages based on their official acts, including acts uh, on the outer perimeter of their duties. The court defined the president's official duties quite broadly to prevent future presidents from being sued for, quote, virtually any allegation that an action was unlawful or was taken for a forbidden purpose. And we explored the contours of civil immunity in my video about Smith's petition to the Supreme Court. Now, Trump's lawyers didn't do a great job on this appeal. He really would have benefited from a good lawyer during this whole process. But if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've suffered a data breach, especially if you got one of those data breach letters, were involved in a car crash, or have dealt with sexual harassment from the Trump family or anyone else, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney who can. It's so important to talk to a lawyer right away so you can get the best representation and find out what your options are. So just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you understand the legal team, you need the Eagle Team. Click on the link below. Now, Nixon versus Fitzgerald gave the president freedom to exercise their official duties without being exposed to litigation for civil damages, uh, which could be initiated by any citizen of the United States. But it did not give the president freedom to break criminal laws. Surprise, surprise! That issue was not before the court in Nixon or in subsequent cases, so it's still an open question. As a DC Circuit noted, quote, the question of whether a former president enjoys absolute immunity from federal criminal liability is one of first impression, uh, meaning that they've never tackled it before. So there's no binding authority on whether the president can go on a crime spree because our presidents haven't claimed the right to do that until Donald Trump. And on appeal, Trump argued that he had immunity on three grounds, quote, one, Article III courts lack the power to review the president's official acts under the separation of powers doctrine. Two, functional policy considerations rooted in separation of powers require immunity to avoid intruding on executive branch functions. And three, the impeachment judgment clause does not permit the criminal prosecution of a former president in the absence of Congress impeaching and convicting him. So Trump first argued that the judiciary has no power to rule on matters of executive power. But in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court ruled that, quote, it is settled law that the separation of powers doctrine does not bar every exercise of jurisdiction over the president of the United States. Trump ignored that and argued that the constitutional structure of separated powers means that, quote, neither a federal nor a state prosecutor nor a state or federal court may sit in judgment over president's official acts, which are vested in the presidency alone. Uh, Trump relied on a quote from Marbury versus Madison that a president's official acts, quote, can never be examinable by the courts. Now, the Court of Appeals rejected this interpretation. Quote, former President Trump misreads Marbury and his progeny, properly understood the separation of powers doctrine may immunize lawful discretionary acts, but it does not bar the federal criminal prosecution of a former president for every official act. In particular, Marbury versus Madison divided presidential acts into two categories, discretionary and ministerial. An act is discretionary if the president is required to exercise his or her judgment or discretion in performing it. An act is ministerial if it is imposed by law and its performance is not dependent on the president's judgment. In Marbury and subsequent cases, the Supreme Court concluded that a judiciary has the power to hear cases where a specific duty is ministerial in that it's assigned by law. The judicial branch is empowered to, quote, review the president's actions when he is bound by law, including by federal criminal statutes. And although, quote, objection may be made that Marbury and his progeny exercise jurisdiction only over subordinate officers, not the president himself, these principles apply to presidents, and the appeals court quoted the Supreme Court's decision in a case involving the widow of Robert E. Lee, where it concluded that officers of the government could be sued despite the Constitution's prohibition on lawsuits against the federal government. Uh, the court said, quote, no man in this country is so high that he is above the law. No officer of the law may set that law at defiance with impunity. All officers of the government from the highest to the lowest 
are creatures of the law and are bound to obey it. And if you're paying attention, yes, it does look like the DC Circuit is lending credibility to the idea that the president is an officer for the purposes of the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment. We'll see if that makes a difference. When Chief Justice Marshall presided over Aaron Burr's treason trial, he ruled that a subpoena could be directed to President Jefferson over Jefferson's objections. The Supreme Court ruled that President Truman's executive order seizing control of most of America's steel mills uh, exceeded his constitutional authority. Uh, Truman acted to settle a labor dispute after Congress rejected his request to authorize that action. First, I'm directing the Secretary of Commerce to take possession of the steel mills and to keep them operating but he had to abide by federal law regardless of whether he agreed with it. Uh, the court ruled that President Nixon had to comply with a subpoena uh, from the Watergate special prosecutor, and it ruled that President Clinton could be sued for sexual harassment. And the Supreme Court ruled that President Trump had to respond to a state criminal subpoena from the New York County District Attorney's Office. So the court rejected the separation of powers argument and held that it had a right to decide this case because, quote, the indictment charges that former President Trump violated criminal laws of general applicability, former President Trump lacked any lawful discretionary authority to defy federal criminal law, and he is answerable in court for his conduct. And the Court of Appeals next considered Trump's argument that criminal liability for presidential action would have a chilling effect on the president's ability to act, quote, fearlessly and impartially uh, in the performance of his duties. Trump explained this argument in a Truth Social post, Without immunity, it would be very hard for a president to enjoy his or her golden years of retirement. Now, the same issue arose in the United States versus Nixon when President Nixon argued that if he had to turn over his secret recordings and documents, it would discourage presidential advisors from speaking with candor. Uh, although, quote, the interest in preserving confidentiality is weighty indeed and entitled to great respect, the court held that, quote, we cannot conclude that advisors will be moved to temper the candor of their remarks by the infrequent occasions of disclosure because of the possibility that such conversations will be called for in the context of a criminal prosecution. The appeals court also looked to the expectations of past presidents. Quote, moreover, past presidents have understood themselves to be subject to impeachment and criminal liability, at least under certain circumstances. So the possibility of chilling executive action is already in effect. Even former President Trump concedes that criminal prosecution of a former president is expressly authorized by the impeachment judgment clause after impeachment and conviction. Trump's concession that he could be prosecuted if he were impeached and convicted by Congress which we'll get to in a few minutes, seemed to doom his argument that the president would be unable to function if he or she believes that they could one day face criminal sanctions. Presidents already behave as if they could be prosecuted. For example, President Ford issued a full pardon to former President Nixon, quote, which both former presidents evidently believed was necessary to avoid Nixon's post-resignation indictment. President Clinton agreed to a five-year suspension of his law license and a $25,000 fine. Quote, in exchange for independent counsel Robert Ray's agreement not to file criminal charges against him, and most damning of all, on February 9th, 2021, during Trump's impeachment trial for election-related crimes, his lawyer, Bruce Castor, argued that rather than being impeached, Trump could be criminally prosecuted. After he's out of office, you go and arrest him. This is one of the reasons why it's important to have a consistent legal theory and argument in all of the proceedings where you might be prosecuted. Now, the court also reasoned that the threat of criminal prosecution could even be a good thing because it could deter possible abuses of power and criminal behavior. But Trump next argued that if presidents do not have broad immunity from criminal law, they'd be open to politically motivated witch hunts. But the court also noted that Trump isn't the only one with important interests in this case. The public has an interest in the enforcement of criminal laws and so does the executive branch. Quote, the president has a constitutionally mandated duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. As part of this duty, the president is responsible for investigating and prosecuting criminal violations. It would be a striking paradox if the president, who alone is vested with the constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, were the sole officer capable of defying those laws with impunity. Though Trump argued that by disputing the results of the 2020 election, he was just doing his duty to take care that the laws were being faithfully executed. But the appeals panel made quick work of that argument, finding that his, quote, alleged conduct conflicts with his constitutional mandate to enforce the laws governing the process of electing the new president. The court said, quote, we cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power. The recognition and implementation of election results, we cannot accept that the office of the presidency places its former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. So with that decided, the appeals panel turned to Trump's third argument, which is that a president can only be charged with a crime if the House of Representatives impeaches him for the conduct and the Senate convicts him. Now, since the Senate didn't convict Trump in his second impeachment trial, Trump claimed that prosecuting him for January 6th related crimes is double jeopardy. Now, this particular argument caused uh, most legal commentators to either just laugh 
or just go apoplectic with rage. Uh, the oral argument on this issue was explosive. Uh, you can just listen to Judge Pan question D. John Sauer. I understand your position to be that a president is immune from criminal prosecution for any official act that he takes as president, even if that action is taken for an unlawful or unconstitutional purpose. Is that correct? With an important exception, which is that if the president is impeached and convicted by the United States Senate in a proceeding that reflects you know, widespread political consensus, that would authorize the prosecution under the plain language of the impeachment judgment clause. Okay. So yes, with that exception. Now here, Sauer tries to avoid a direct answer, instead shifting gears to mention that Bill Clinton allegedly sold a presidential pardon to Mark Rich, but wasn't prosecuted. As long as it's an official act, I mean, in certain cases, purely private conduct under Clinton against Jones, he'd be subject to prosecution for that as long as he's not in office. But now Judge Pan just goes for the legal jugular. But if he weren't, there would be no criminal prosecution, no criminal liability for that? Chief Justice's opinion in murder against Madison and, uh, 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 and our constitutional tradition and the plain language of the impeachment judgment clause all clearly presuppose that what the founders were concerned about was not- I asked you a yes, no, yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so, so your answer is- is, no. is my answer is qualified yes there's a political process that would have to occur under our, the structure of our constitution so d john sauer told judge pan that trump couldn't be prosecuted if he ordered seal team six to kill his political rival unless congress impeached and convicted him first the implications of this are pretty stunning now sauer imagines that if this happened our crack congress would speedily impeach so that a criminal trial could happen but you'd think that congress would be a little gun shy uh, no pun intended about starting an impeachment proceeding against a president who just ordered the military to kill his his opponent. Even assuming that members of their own party would be willing to do this, you'd think that this type of president would be willing to take out members of Congress who dared to write articles of impeachment. Now, it's hard to imagine a state of affairs that would be more chilling uh, to the impeachment function than the notion that a president could give assassination orders of their political rivals. So Sauer argued that if the president ordered a hit on his political rival, uh, Congress would have to give law enforcement the green light to prosecute. But this would give all presidents, including current President Biden, the right to order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate political rivals as long as they could convince enough senators to acquit. Now, Sauer could have told the judge that ordering an assassination would obviously be prosecutable regardless of what Congress thought. But since Trump made the argument that criminal liability was restricted only by the impeachment clause, Sauer was pretty boxed in. So the panel looked at the text of the impeachment judgment clause and concluded the following, quote, the impeachment judgment clause is focused solely on those who are convicted by the Senate following impeachment by the House. The first part of the clause limits the penalties that can be imposed based on an impeachment conviction. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office, disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust or profit under the United States. The second part makes clear that the limited consequences of the impeachment do not immunize convicted officers from criminal prosecution. The party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. In former President Trump's view, however, the word convicted in the second phrase implicitly bestows immunity on presidents who are not convicted based on a negative implication. He asserts that the impeachment judgment clause presupposes that a president is not criminally liable absent a conviction in the Senate. Other courts have rejected this tortured interpretation of the impeachment judgment clause. And the court says that this interpretation runs counter to the text uh, and that its reliance on a negative implication is an immediate red flag. The framers knew how to explicitly grant criminal immunity in the constitution as they did to legislators in the speech or debate clause. The court continued that quote, the impeachment judgment clause merely states that the party convicted shall nevertheless be subject to criminal prosecution. The text says nothing about non-convicted officials. Former President Trump's reading rests on a logical fallacy, stating that if the president is convicted, he can be prosecuted, does not necessarily mean that if the president is not convicted, he cannot be prosecuted. And on the subject of the framers' intent, the court concluded that the framers actually wanted to make sure that a subsequent conviction would not be barred by a president's impeachment conviction. The court also noted the clause applies not just to presidents, but also to uh, vice president and all civil officers of the United States. And Trump's reading would prohibit the executive branch from prosecuting all sorts of officers for crimes they committed in office, unless Congress impeached and convicted them. This would turn Congress into a kind of criminal court. And finally, Trump argued alternatively that double jeopardy principles prevented him from being criminally prosecuted for January 6th related crimes. But as any law student knows, 
The Double Jeopardy Clause, quote, guards only against imposition of multiple criminal punishments for the same offense. Although Double Jeopardy applies only to criminal punishments, impeachment imposes political punishments. Double Jeopardy is the right not to be put in jeopardy of life and limb. And it's even narrower than that sounds because Jeopardy only attaches when someone is being prosecuted basically for the exact same charge. Now, Congress can't imprison someone for a crime. It can only boot them out of office. This means that subjecting Trump to possible criminal penalties like fines and imprisonment cannot be double jeopardy. So the question is what happens next? The circuit court's decision was by a three judge panel. Trump can appeal to the entire DC circuit, what's called en banc, where the case would be decided by all the judges on the court. Now, the full panel will probably not be overturning this decision, but normally if you appeal en banc, it would delay things. But here the DC circuit specifically carved that out and says that even if Trump wants to appeal en banc, which he's entitled to, that will not delay any further proceedings. The DC Circuit will issue its mandate on February 12th, granting the special counsel's request for a fast turnaround for a potential appeal to the Supreme Court. Now that's a win for Jack Smith, who cut the time from 30 days down to six. And according to the order, the case will return to Judge Chutkin on that date, unless Trump has appealed to the Supreme Court, which of course he definitely will. Now, in terms of the appeal to the Supreme Court, it only takes four justices out of the nine to grant cert so that the Supreme Court will take it up. But it takes five justices to decide to implement a stay while that appeal is pending. And now that we have the benefit of the DC Circuit's opinion, which is one step below the Supreme Court, and it, it's about as thorough and bulletproof an opinion as you could want, uh, maybe the Supreme Court justices will say that it got it right and there's no need for them to grant cert. On the other hand, even if there are five justices who agree with every word of the DC circuit, they might feel that it's so important that they need to take up this case so that they can have the final word and put their stamp of approval on the DC circuit's uh, opinion. Now, what's interesting is that the ruling on immunity has been covered extensively by almost 500 news outlets. 32% of the reporting comes from the left and 23% is coming from the right. And if you compare the headlines, you start to see something interesting emerging. Now on the left, you have outlets using the words like shredded and calling the court's opinion scathing, while on the right, news outlets usually stick to is not immune. These word changes are subtle, but they play a big role in how readers perceive the story. The first set of words might provide a sense of catharsis for liberal readers who wanna see Trump crash and burn, while the second set of words provides a deliberately unadorned account of the opinion downplaying it. Now this is all possible thanks to today's sponsor, Ground News, a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. I especially like the Ground News comparison feature, which highlights specific differences between left and right reporting. This is so important as we head into the election season because we need to be able to separate the facts from the noise. So for example, when your neighbor tells you that one third of Americans think that Biden's election was illegitimate, you can look that story up in the Ground News blind spot feed and see that he's talking about a poll back in December, mostly covered by right-leaning news sources, and all of a sudden you have a common ground to base your conversation in. You can actually engage with the facts like who conducted the poll and the sample size. When we all have access to the same information, it's easier to bridge the gap with people on either side of the spectrum, even if you don't agree with them. And all this is so important so we don't live in an echo chamber or get misled by subtle and sometimes not so subtle language in the news. Ground News is a fantastic tool for sifting through daily misinformation and bias. They provide all the tools you need to be a critical thinker, and I cannot recommend them highly enough. And what's great is that right now they're offering 40% off their Vantage subscription. This subscription includes unlimited access to all Ground News features, and with the sale, the subscription is less than $5 a month. Or you can start with their Pro Plan, which is less than $1. Now, you can only access this discount through my link, so click on the link that's on screen right now or down below, and you'll get 40% off of Ground News and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent. Parent. So click below. And after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.